Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Smart Building Session here at Smart City Expo and World Congress. I'm Bob Snyder. I'm going to be your host today. I'm going to be leading a very expert panel in smart buildings, and it's organized in cooperation with the Smart City Expo and World Congress by the Smart Building Conference of ISE. Normally, the smart building and the smart city markets seem very separated, seem far apart. And yet, we have so much in common and so many things that make us similar. We believe there is far more overlap than has been thought through in previous years. And we believe we need to talk. On that point, we've raised a panel with the understanding that smart cities face a obstacles of big projects. And those obstacles can be quite numbing, quite confronting. And yet, smart buildings can offer a scalable foundation for creating the smart city. And across all types of uses, the smart city infrastructure addresses many of the same needs as the city infrastructure, whether that's energy, water, trash, lighting, ventilation, or whatever. So this session, as a totality, will dig into how smart building technology can help push cities closer to their goal of smart city. Some people may refer to what's happening as digital disruption. I would prefer to look at it and consider it as digital augmentation to improve and to enhance what we know can be a better life for the cities. After I'm off the stage, I will be bringing up two keynotes for an overview. Then there'll be a short networking opportunity where you can ask questions personally of those keynoters. Following that, my friend and moderator, Matthew Marson, will be conducting a panel of speakers. Matthew is the head of Smart Places at WSP and has been focused, focused on the designing and delivering digital real estate for the real estate transformation for the human-centered Internet of Things and technologies within the built environment. He's a trained architect and chartered engineer and will lead you through that panel. Each panelist will speak for eight minutes on a topic, and after that panel, we'll have open questions for the panelists. I'm now going to this is the picture of Matthew so that you'll know when he comes up for moderating. I'm going to introduce the fact that we're going to have to be very strict on time here. Please allow us to move forward fast so that we can get the information in. My first speaker is Thorsten Muller, who is the head of Global Product Group Building and Home Automation Solutions at ABB. He's had p &L responsibility for ABB's global building and home automation business, including the wiring, accessories, KNX components and systems, and complete solutions for comfort, safety, security, and efficiency. He's leading the digital transformation of ABB's building and smart home portfolio, including all the new go-to-market approaches and business models. And he's previously been Group Senior Vice President Innovation and InnoVentures at Osram. He's been CEO at Bosch Connected Devices and Solutions. And he's been the global head of the business area for connected things at Robert Bosch. This will be our first keynoter Thorsten Muller. The second keynoter who will come up unintroduced because I'm doing it now is Charles Reed Anderson, who has flown in from Singapore. 
He's called Asia's IoT smart cities and prop tech pragmatist. Do not call him an evangelist. He's the pragmatist, and you'll find out why in his speech. He's a globally recognized IoT smart cities and prop tech industry thought leader. He's presented at more than 200 events. His company, CRNA and Associates, provides technology and vendor agnostic advice to governments, enterprises, technology vendors, and also on how to successfully navigate the increasingly complex technology solution ecosystem. So without further ado, I'd like to bring up my first speaker, Thorsten Muller from ABB. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. I will take you today on the journey of what we think about smart buildings and smart homes of the future. And as Bob mentioned, I'm also like to do it in a pragmatic way. So I'm not looking 20, 30 years down the road. I want to show you what will happen in the next few years. So basically, let me start with some numbers. What are the big underlying drivers which support our business? So first of all, urbanization. So by 2050, 70% of the global population will live in urban city centers. There's another number, I think, which makes it even more clear. Every week, a new city with one million people is founded around the world. Digitalization, we talk about it now for one decade, I think, especially when it comes to IoT. We have reached now more than 13 billion connected devices. So this is one of the few trajectories where all these future-looking companies really hit the numbers. So it was not just a promise, the, the global economy has delivered. And of course, we talk about this thing which is called prosumer, which means that a lot of energy is generated locally, so 150 gigawatts by 2025 just by solar. And of course, there is also highly flexible local demand, especially when we talk about EV charging, which will be a very important thing for future smart cities. So approximately more than 50% already by 2040. So when we talk about smart cities, we think there are three core pillars which will be the foundation of a smart city. The first one are commercial buildings, like offices, hotels, and also commercial real estate. The second big pillar will be the smart homes, because actually these are the two areas where we will be most of the time in a smart city. And of course, we talk about smart mobility and electric mobility. And here, ABB is not only looking into car charging, we are also very much active into charging of public movement infrastructure like buses. Before I take you on the journey in the future, I want to share just a few minutes on what is currently possible and also what are currently the obstacles. So when we talk about a smart home, currently everything is around three core things. One of them is energy. So you want to drive down your energy consumption both from a monetary perspective as well as from a sustainability perspective. On the other hand, you want to invest into good comfort at home. And one of the things which is also quite big is safety and security. So you want to feel protected in your home. And this gave some new alleys to the industry, especially when we talk about how you interact with your home. So smartphones became the main interface on interacting with your home. However, Always taking out a smartphone takes some time. So we already see voice assist coming into the buildings, which from our perspective will also be a major part of the future. So if you look into the ABB portfolio, actually we have two components for that. One of them is our ABB Ability Platform. That's a cloud-based platform infrastructure which allows outside access towards the smart building, but also things like maintenance and commissioning but also we invested ver into vertical integrated solutions. For example, our secure at home portfolio or our smart home portfolio, which is called free at home. But if you look into this, the current state of the industry, this is all pretty much verticalized without the sufficient connection between the different systems, especially when it comes to different vendors. If you look into the commercial building, we have pretty much the same picture. However, we have further challenges. So one of them is, of course, we have much higher electrical loads, especially when it comes to HVAC and to, um, to other big electrical systems in a connected building. But also, the information structure is different. 
The reason for that is that there are different tenants in one building. So it's not only one household owner who's taking care of his, of his building. It's a multi-tenant building and many different stakeholders have interest in there. So stakeholders like the property owner, the property operator, the tenant, and last but definitely not least, the user which is inside of that building. So also here, we took the same approach. We have a common technology backbone, which is called ABB Ability. And then we used industry standard solutions, and that's important for us, like KNX technology, in order to build complete solution sets. One of the dominating trends, which is emerging now since around about two years, is the fact that more and more of these technologies become IP enabled. So basically, we are moving away from special protocols for buildings. We are moving more and more into an IT-like infrastructure. So this is basically the status quo, and I think you can see it already in many buildings around the globe. But let's be frank, this is not exciting. This is not the thing which really boosts you to the next level. And therefore, I want to share with you now some insights what can happen down the road in the next several years. So as I said, this is not 20 years down the road. This is in the next years. So when we talk about future opportunities, once again, let me start with the residential buildings. One of the big elements which now comes in, and it's pretty much supported by legislation, is the fact that many of these buildings become a so-called prosumer, which means they generate their own energy by renewables. They can store the energy in batteries or maybe in batteries of cars. And at the same time, they also can donate their energy to the public network. And I think that's one thing which needs a lot of focus, because if you look into future CO2 emissions, buildings become much more prominent. And if you think about every week a new city with one million people, this is additional CO2 footprint, which was not there this week. It's there next week. So we have to take care to optimally adjust energy consumption and production inside of our own buildings. One thing that I'm totally, let's say, annoyed of is all these different apps that I have for my smartphone for taking care of different smart home applications from different vendors in one smart home. So basically, I don't want to pull out my phone just to switch on the light. That's, for me, much too complicated. One of the solutions that is already quite popular in Asia, and I'm very sure it will come also to Europe and North America, is using AI-based technologies. Technologies like big data analytics, technologies like machine learning or neural networks, in order to understand the requirements and the behaviors of a user of a building. So basically, Face recognition can be one of these technologies. We already use it in our smartphones, so it's nothing new to us. Why not use it in buildings? If you look into the commercial building, the situation is even more complex. So we need additional aspects that we have to take care of. So if you think about a large office building or retail building where you have a parking garage and you bring in all these electric cars, then definitely you will run into trouble with the electric energy which is, which is available for you from the public network. So you really have to find smart solutions on when will you charge the car, how many cars are charged simultaneously, where can I buffer my energy in the building, yeah? can I, for example, switch off the co air conditioning system for a few minutes or take it down by one degree just in order to preserve the maximum energy that the building is consuming. This is called peak shaving. And also, it's a very real threat that if you do not introduce these smart technologies, that you all of a sudden might face a blackout of your building just because so many electric vehicles are charging at the same time. So you cannot wait until this happens. You have to take preventive measures, and electric load management in the building will be a prerequisite for future buildings. This is also, of course, addressing the topic of energy efficiency. And I was just in Amsterdam two weeks ago. There was a meeting of the World Economic Forum. And I learned that in the Netherlands, there's now a legislation that you are only allowed to rent apartments, rent office space, if your building is hitting a minimum sustainability standard. So the Netherlands really went ahead and said, OK, if you do not fulfill the sustainability targets, you are not allowed to rent your, your building anymore. 
But we should always also think about other stakeholders inside of a building. It's not only the user, it's not only the tenant, it's also pretty much the installer. And when we think about technology, technology should life more, make life more easier and not more complex. But the more technologies we have inside a building, the more knowledge is required from the installer. That is somehow hitting a boundary. So we think about that we should have a system which can be configured, which can be commissioned already outside of the building just by a cloud connection. And then the installer comes in, just plugs everything into the ceiling, and everything is self-configured. And also, if you look into the life cycle of a building, if you introduce new sensors, new actuators, they are detected automatically and automatically integrated into the system. So let's look a little bit more down the road. We talked about face recognition technologies. And as I said, we all have it in our smartphone. We all have it already in online banking. So it seems to be a trusted technology. Somehow, there's still a barrier to take that for commercial buildings. And if I look into my own personal life, so I have a global role in ABB. And I have three different access systems for different buildings of ABB in different regions. So one of them for Switzerland, one of them for Germany, and one of them for the rest of the world. And that's definitely one thing you do not want to have. So why not just take the face? You are recognized when you enter the building. The door will be open. And uh, all the individual needs will be pre-configured. For example, temperature, lighting levels, whatever you like. Next step would be when you enter the elevator that the elevator already knows where you are heading. How does it work? Well, I think one major prerequisite of successful solution are open ecosystems and something which is called API economy, which means that you connect different solutions via so-called APIs. So if the system knows from your Outlook account that your next meeting will be on the sixth floor and the camera identifies you as person XYZ, then the lift will be automatically dispatched to the sixth floor. Well, this is not only convenient for you, this also gives a lot of additional space usage inside the building for the building owner. Because if you just need four elevators instead of five elevators, you gain a lot of space inside your building, which you can run out to new tenants. So if you approach your office, then we can use the lighting infrastructure. The lighting infrastructure smartly connected can guide you to a free space. And this again brings me back to the topic of how can we optimize space in buildings? Why should we do it? If you look how much you pay for electrical energy consumption, for example, of lighting per month and per square meter, it's approximately three euros. But if you look what you pay for a square meter of rent space, it's already 30 euros. So if we can help our clients in optimizing office space, there's a factor of 10 compared to energy usage, which we can optimize. And if you think one step further, there's even a more valuable asset inside your building. These are the users. So a typical office user costs approximately 300 euros per square meter in months. So if you can help them increase their productivity, for example, by technologies like human-centric lightings, so where you have simulate the movement of the sun over the horizon inside the building, you can boost their productivity. But this all need somehow that you know much more about your user. And I think these things, these wearable devices, can be an important, let's say, cornerstone for that technology, because they can tell you the position of the user. They can tell you when he will arrive at the office building just by GPS, and then you can already warm up your office. Also, in emergency circumstances, I think that's also an important topic. If you want to evacuate a building, currently these are pretty dumb technologies. You have these signs over there. But if you have dynamic escape fast lighting, you can direct the people away from the fire and evacuate the building much faster and much more securely. You can also see are people still in the building. And if yes, you can dispatch the firefighter exactly to the right location. So this is a new technology that is already hitting the road now within ABB for our Australian market, but we will roll this technology out globally. And the last two points I'd like to mention, predictive maintenance is a big thing. We all knew it from Industry 4.0, so inside of factories, where we can use sensor technologies, AI, machine learning, to understand the health state of assets and also predict when they will fail. 
by using the ability technology, this can also be brought to buildings. So you can see when an HVAC system will fail. And you can react uh, beforehand on this before it happens. And the last topic that I'd like to mention, this is called the digital twin. Or in building terms, it's called the building information modeling. It's a digital twin of your building, but it's also the digital twin of all of your assets. And this will help tremendously in all phases of a building. So it starts with the planning phase, where you have 3D models and all parameters of all the things that you install inside of buildings. It helps you in the construction phase, where you can clearly identify where you have to put which asset. It helps you in the operations phase by optimizing the whole building technology by AI. But it also helps you for the maintenance phase and also later on for the deconstruction phase. So I know we are strict on timing, 20 minutes. I hope I have done it. Let's think about the four megatrends. Let's summarize it. It's urbanization. It's digitalization, which now really hits the road. And it's this thing which is called prosumer, which means a lot of flexible demand and flexible supply inside of buildings. We have five core expectations that our building is always under control, is secure and safe, that we have more flexibility inside of buildings, that we are efficient and sustainable inside of our buildings, and that we have the right level of comfort. And as I said, when we talk about smart cities, from our perspective, this starts with the buildings and the mobility. Because this is really where you spend, I don't know, 80, 90% of the time if you're inside of a smart city. Thank you. OK, that's good to know. OK, good afternoon, everyone. And we have slides. OK, I'm going to get a whiteboard. I'm just going to draw out my slides for you. If they can come up with something. Here we go. OK, so we've talked about smart buildings. Now we're going to talk about smart cities. Um, a lot of this is based off some research I did with JLL. And we put out a report called Smart Cities Success. So if you want more detail, you can download that for free online. But let's get to it. Um, Bob already gave an introduction about what I do. Um, it's pretty unique because I actually sit in Asia in the middle of the ecosystem, which means I have customers on all sides from governments, the VC firms and banks, enterprise customers and tech vendors. I do a lot of go-to-market strategy. The real thing I'm supposed to do is know what's really going on. Um, and I'm very agnostic. And that's important because it means I'm not selling you anything and I have nothing to sell you. So you're going to get my honest views on this stuff. And I'm also a pragmatist. Um, I don't evangelize saying everything's perfect. I'm going to tell you what needs to fix or be fixed in the industry for us to move forward. And I have some side projects as well. So if you like what I rant about, I've got a podcast. I do a lot of work with an accelerator and VC firm out of Korea and global called Spark Labs. And I'm an advisor from McKinsey. Blah, blah. Next stuff. All right, let's have some fun. Vote. Are smart cities transforming the way we work, live, and play? If you agree, raise your hand. OK. And are they overhyped and underdelivered? OK, so it looks like number two won on that one. Um, in reality, it's a bit of both. Um, they can be complicated, frustrating, and overhyped, but they are the future. Um, but everyone always wants to know, you know, what are the best smart cities? So what's the number one ranked ones? Well, here it is. This report just came out from IMD in Switzerland and the Singapore University of Technology and Design in October. They ranked over 100 cities, and these are the top 10. Uh, a couple of interesting things. Number one, where I come from, Singapore is number one. Um, you've also got Taipei in there at number seven. So that's two from Asia, one from New Zealand. The rest are Western Europe. Um, not one in the top 10 comes from North America, which is interesting. But then it really wouldn't be fair if I only looked at one. So I decided to look at a few other ones. So ESA in Spain came out, um, had one recently in May. Easy Park out of the Nordics had one come out in February in AT Kearney. Each of these looked at over 100 cities. And Singapore still stayed in the top 10 across all of them. So maybe there is a bit of method to the madness. But then when you start looking at the rest of them, and the color coding, if it's in black, it means it stayed in the top 10. Red means it's somewhere between 11 to 49. And yellow is 50 plus. So what I'm kind of wondering is, how does something like Auckland go from being number six in one and number 58 in the other? 
And then also Bilbao in Spain, which comes in at number nine in the IMD in Singapore survey. What does the ESA have against Bilbao where they rank them 107? Um, so what happens is these rankings are subjective. Everybody loves them because they want to say that I am a great city. And you can say this, Bilbao can go into its boss and say, I'm a great city. And his boss might say, actually, no, you're bad because I just read the ESA report. So these things are dangerous because we can get too caught up in it. In reality, just get your work done and start making your cities move forward. Um, ESA, if you wanted to know, they actually ranked London number one. But then Easy Park ranks London number 50. Um, if you wanted about AT Kearney, they rank New York number one. But you can see they don't do too well elsewhere. There's one missing here, Barcelona. So everybody always talks about how Barcelona is a very highly ranked, respected, smart city, but not according to the recent rankings. So it has some work to do. But like I said, on these, they're subjective. I'm just trying to point out, don't get caught up in the hype on these things. But now, that doesn't make sense, but at least when we look at the numbers and the market opportunity, this should be clear and easy to understand, right? Well, I guess there's a bit of a problem with this too. I just did one morning, I decided to type in smart city forecasts, and in 2023, it could be worth about 190 billion or as much as 1.9 trillion. Um, in 2024, as little as 330 or 3.1, or in 2025, 237 versus 2.4 trillion. So the good news is, however big you want the smart city market opportunity to be, you can find somebody probably who said it. Um, these could all be right because we don't really know what a smart city is. Everybody analyzes it differently. Everybody incorporates different things. Zion has one smart city forecast at 2.7, and that's just the IoT component at 3.30. So these things, we have to be careful with it. Forecasts are dangerous, but I saved the best for last. This is my favorite forecast ever. ABI says 5G for connected cities will generate $17 trillion in economic growth by 2035. So why do I love this? I do a lot in the 5G space, which means I work with operators, I work with network equipment manufacturers. We don't know the use cases yet of how we're gonna make money. So what do these guys know about 5G that nobody else does? And then I thought about it, I'm like, 2035? That's 16 years from now. In 16 years, I'm at retirement age. Um, so does it really make sense? And then I'm like, well, let me think about that. What was I doing 16 years ago? So I typed in what's the most best-selling smartphone of 2003. This is it. Now there's a few people old enough. How many people have seen a phone like this before? Yeah? What did you do on that phone? You played Snake. Okay? You played Snake. If you played Snake, that doesn't mean you should be actually doing a forecast and anticipating iOS and Android and the advancements in technology. So we have to be very careful with these forecasts. Always question the hype. A lot of times they're done just to get headlines. Um, I know I used to work for a firm that did this and I hated when we would do it. So be careful with this. But with smart cities, in reality, it's very early days. This is a survey or study done by Roland Berger earlier this year. They looked at all the smart cities worldwide. Only 153 had published a strategy. Of those 153, only 15 had a strategy that included targets and activities. So only 10% of those. And then only eight of those had a strategy that included implementation. Smart cities, it's not like we're gonna hit them this year or next year. It's a very long journey, and we're in the earliest phases of this right now. It takes a long time for this stuff to work. So be patient with it, don't expect too much too soon. In reality, if you're managing a smart city, this is the challenge you face. It's being like this little boy looking up at all these steps going, what do I actually do? Because smart cities are really, really complex and complicated. So think about this. I love the Shanghai example. Shanghai has 24 million people, 33 government agencies, 16 districts, 99 sub-districts, three counties, and 205 towns. Now what if they approached you and said, write me my smart city strategy? How do you actually herd all those cats into one strategy? So the most important thing they need to do is focus on their PMO. Uh, I think some of the team from Taipei are in here. They've probably got the best PMO um, that I've seen in the industry. Um, they've pulled it together and they're driving a lot of innovation. We'll cover more on that later. Another thing that was happening at Taipei, when I t did this report for JLL, I spoke with uh, Chen Yu, Leo, who's in the back, I'm sure, somewhere. Um, and we talked about the challenges he faced in implementing his smart city strategy. And he said, culture is the first thing you need to deal with when you want to implement something different. In the public sector, technology is the easy part. Now think about that. 
All these things we're talking about, there's tech vendors everywhere out there. That's the stuff they view as easy. It's changing your culture. Cities tend to be very bureaucratic. They tend to have a lot of red tape and people are afraid to fail. You need to give them that freedom where they feel that they can actually innovate, experiment, and fail if necessary. And of course then, governance is essential. How do you manage all these projects within a city? Because a city's gonna have 30 or so government agencies. Think about Tokyo. In preparation for 2020, they launched a new campaign. So they have 360 policy targets and a four-year work schedule for each. So they're really trying to manage their smart city initiatives to make sure it delivers value. But it's not only that, it's about doing incident management. And this is an example out of Jakarta, an app called Clue, um, where people can actually say, I've got problems on my street, there's litter, there's illegally parked cars, and it gets tracked through the system, and you do your incident manage, you govern the incident management process so you can show we've actually fixed it. It's no use having someone saying, I've got something wrong, and you're like, I know there's something wrong, and you don't go back and show them you fixed it. So governance for cities is essential as well. Next challenge is every solution is complex. Any prop tech, smart city, smart building solution works like this. You've got a thing that's gonna capture some type of data, send it over a network through one of about five different platforms to an app. All that data is gonna be stored. You gotta secure it, integrate it, and manage it. Now think about that. No one vendor can do all of that. So every single solution is bringing together multiple products from multiple vendors to create a single solution. So it's complex, and how do we actually manage this? And then you go and look at the vendors, and it's fragmented, because there's thousands of vendors that say, I am the best device, network, or platform. Um, so who, if you're a city, do you actually want to work with? And how do you find the right ones that actually meet your needs and requirements, and let's face it, your price points as well? Another challenge we face, funding is limited. I'm sure when everybody was making their smart city announcements and they got up on stage with the vendors and did this big, you know, big group hug, everyone probably thought this is great because cities are gonna write big blank checks and they don't. Cities don't have a lot of money to spend on this stuff. And what we thought initially was, well, at least they're gonna throw a bunch of money and it'll be CapEx driven. And it isn't because they don't know the use cases yet. So what they're looking to do is more OpEx type solutions. That means as a service. That means lower revenues up front. And also it means that a lot of the vendors aren't prepared to deal with this. Their sales teams and go-to-market and delivery teams aren't set up for doing small proof of concepts. That's why so many of those fail. They're set up for doing big implementations. So what are they doing around this? Well, with the funding issue, we start seeing a lot more public-private partnerships. And there's some excellent examples of this. And this is one that was done in Alibaba's hometown of Hangzhou. And they created a city brain. And Hangzhou used to have the fifth most congested city in all of China. And if you spend much time traveling in China, there's some congested cities there. Um, the city brain leverages data that exists. And this is what I love. We were talking about AI earlier. It combines data sources. So it gets information from intersection cameras. It starts looking at the GPS data from the vehicles. It combines all of that to understand what's going on in the city, and it coordinates the lights. Now, in one year, what it was able to do, or after two years, it's now the 57th most congested. So that's a pretty big improvement. And now they've started selling that across China, to Macau, and to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia as well. But PPPs have a downside as well. Um, I looked at PPPs in China. Um, in 2018, there was 14,220 initiatives, 2.7 trillion in value. But during that same year, they canceled over 2,400 initiatives that had 360 billion value. So think about that. PPPs sound great on paper. We still have problems with people not hitting the deliverables, with corruption and everything else. So PPPs can be dangerous, but it's good for cities because they need it. They don't have the money to fund these large smart city initiatives. So takeaway number two, technology isn't the biggest problem. We are as people. So next, the elephant in the room, security. Why do we not care about security until it's too late? Um, we keep making these mistakes, and I love this stat out of London. London has had 109 million cyber attacks in the last few years on four tourist attractions. Kew Gardens, Imperial War Museum, Tate Gallery, and National History Museum. And 75% of those were targeting spyware, or, or targeting confidential information. So we're, just, we're always going to be under attack. People are going to look for weak points. Out in Asia, by us, we've had some significant problems recently. In Singapore, we had a data leak where 1.5 million patient medical records were leaked online, including the prime ministers. We also, we leaked 800,000 blood donors information and 14,200 HIV positive residents. 
their information was leaked online. Malaysia had a huge leak as well. 46 million mobile subscriber data was leaked from the government's commission, uh, communications and multimedia commission. Now this is a bad, but it's actually a bit of good news there. As you can see, the population is only 32 million, so their mobile penetration rate is actually really good. It's about 150%. So um, you got to take the good with the bad. But on security in Singapore, what they've realized is some of the most risky devices are the small, most simple things. And what they've started to see is how do we actually control and secure these new endpoints? So smart meters, smart plugs. You might not think they're hackable and there's nothing you can really do, but if I can control the street lights, I can create chaos. If I can control a panic button, I can destroy emergency services by sending them everywhere. Um, so there's a lot of risky things you can do around this. And here's my tip for you. If you want to understand best practice for smart city security, Singapore government is very thorough when it writes its technical requirement documents. And the one they did for IoT security for Smart Nation is out there, it's online. Save yourself the trouble, copy what they've done because they've really looked at this thoroughly. Takeaway number three, ignore security at your peril. So what should we do now? What should cities do? Innovate. Don't buy a pepper. I hate pepper, this isn't innovative. Uh, Leo said it perfectly earlier, it's a tablet on wheels. Um, they're not exciting, they, don't, they frustrate me when I see them. I wanna see different types of innovation because when we think about the word innovation, we think about the latest gadget or widget and it's not that. It can be as simple as a new method, an idea or product. And I'll give you an idea about a new approach and how that really drove innovation. In Taipei, they wanted to create the Smart Taipei Initiative where the government is a platform and the city works as a living lab. Now, everybody says this. They've actually delivered against it by doing something quite unique. They took their PMO and they pulled, pulled it out of the government. So basically, the government agencies become a customer of the PMO, which means they go and talk to the government agency saying, what initiatives do you need? We'll go out and look for that for you. But then they also have to assess market demand and understand their other customers, which is the citizens. So they did what I think is probably the largest survey um, of citizens to find out what they want from uh, smart cities. About 32,000 citizens were surveyed in this. And then what they did, and I know you're not gonna believe this, but a government actually proactively engaged 400 ICT vendors, from big MNCs to small startups, to say let's go out there and start tackling these problems. Let's start doing these initiatives and let's do some proof of concepts. Now, proof of concepts in smart cities are needed because we must experiment. But when you see it, most cities are doing a few here, a few there. They have delivered 175 infrastructure-centric and citizen-centric smart city proof of concepts. That's impressive because they're the ones who are out there experimenting. Are they all gonna work? Of course not. I want a lot of them to fail, but I want some new use cases that will work going forward. Role of innovation number two, Look at the stuff we have already today. Leverage existing data. Like I said about the Alibaba uh, City Brain solution, they leverage existing data. So think about our buildings right now. All, we're capturing this information now. Biometric access, occupancy sensors, HSVC, lighting, surveillance, meeting rooms. The problem is these things all sit on separate platforms, which means if I'm trying to manage a workplace or a facility, I've got to go and look across 10 or 12 different platforms to understand what's actually going on, which makes it very difficult to make actionable intelligence out of it. So what we're seeing now is vendors who are coming out there and creating a platform of platform and integrating all this data together. Um, there was a great one out of London called Demand Logic. Um, the one I'm talking about today is out of China. It's called eQuota. This startup has basically solved a lot of the problems for people who own buildings and shopping centers. They basically can go in there saying, we're gonna use AI, we're gonna take all your existing data and guarantee we can show you how to get a return on your investment within six months. And they have taken off and they've picked up some of the biggest shopping malls. And if you've ever seen a shopping mall in China, they're massive and he's picked up one of the biggest chains, so they're growing quite quick. But this is great, I love it because there's no capex. They can come in there and say, I'm gonna use AI and I'm gonna solve problems for you and guarantee you ROI in a few months. That sells to a city because no capex, guaranteed return, they like that. Next one, don't forget about the future tech. There is some cool things out there. Um, AR, VR, machine learning and deep learning is gonna be very exciting. Blockchain when we figure out how to implement it in more use cases. 5G when it eventually rolls out will give us high speed networks and drones will be fun too from everything from taxis to food deliveries or whatever else. 
look at these things. Don't ignore them, but don't wait around for them either because it's going to be a long time before we can really roll out a lot of solutions that deliver value on this. Augmented reality is a perfect example. I mean, think about this. After Pokemon, we still can't find anything else to do with augmented reality. The tech is fine. We need to find better use cases. So takeaway number four, innovation doesn't require the latest tech. New processes, look at what Smart Type A did. Think of a, a problem in a new way, you can deliver great value. So what should you do now? Number two, collaborate. And this is where cities are making progress. In ASEAN, they launched the ASEAN Smart Cities Network, which brings together 26 cities, and they're basically sharing information. Best proof of concepts, our strategy. If you want to sell into ASEAN, go download the document on this. It gives you every person's contact details and tells you the initiatives of where they're going to spend money. Then we've got vendors doing it. In China, you had the PATH initiative. This is four of the biggest technology brands in China packaging it up together saying, listen, we're going to use Ping On, Alibaba, Tencent, Huawei, and we're going to package it and go target the 500 smart cities in China, saying we can solve all your problems there. So they're starting to collaborate more, and that's exciting. But then there's also Go Smart, um, which is the global organization of smart cities. And what they're actually doing is bringing together not only cities, but ICT vendors. So now they're close to about 200 different associations involved in this, um, where they're sharing proof of concepts, doing inner city proof of concepts, creating special interest groups. It's about collaborating further. So takeaway number five, you can't do it alone. Collaborate or die. Now I can take a breath. Where do we go from here? I've just given you a ton of information that you're never going to remember. So what I've done now is I've combined it all into a slide or two. And this is really, if you want to understand what we need to change to deliver value in this ecosystem, to move it forward, it's this. Think about it in its most simplest form. What are we really trying to do? We're trying to solve a problem and using technology to do that. If I'm a city, I'm worried about elderly care management or I'm worried about improving the quality of life of people who live in public housing. If I'm a business, I want to drive operational excellence or reduce my costs and I want to secure everything. And we've got all these great technology toys but how do we actually bridge that gap and bring them together? So on the supply side, you've got the technology vendors that do a great job of doing this, but a lot of the innovation from the new technology enablers will actually come out of the startups. And it's very difficult for a startup to work with a technology vendor or to reach out to cities or enterprise customers. On the demand side, we've got thousands of cities out there and business customers. So basically we're trying to get these people all to come together, but we're taking tens of thousands of entities in the middle there and making it congested. And it should be simple. We want to use tech, I want to solve a problem. And so we're trying to find ways to access innovation and collaborate. So I mentioned the ASEAN Smart City Network. They're combining the cities together saying, let's work together and deliver value. But then you've got the tech vendors saying, well, we can work together. But what you want is more collaboration. So what Go Smart actually does is it brings tech vendors together with cities and they're sharing the same information to move it forward. And these are steps in the right direction but it's not accessing as much of the startups as we would like. So then what you've got is people saying, well, great, I've got a corporate venture capital arm, or I'm going to create an innovation lab, and then I'm going to go have access to startups. A quick stat on this, uh, as of right now, as of May this year, 60% of innovation labs fail within the first two years. So if you do it, good luck. Um, also, what you have, talent incubators, the likes of Antler, Entrepreneur First, who say, give me two bright guys, I'm going to go create my own startup, and then I'll try to take it to market. And then you've got your normal accelerator programs. Now these can be accelerators that are based on location. So I mentioned Spark Labs. Spark Labs has Taipei, they've got Seoul. They do them by industry as well. So Spark Labs has a smart agriculture one. They've got an energy one in Oman. Or they do it by blockchain for a technology one. So that's still accessing it, but it's not getting it out to the business customers. So now what you're seeing is accelerators partnering with business customers to drive this innovation and create their own accelerators with it. Spark Labs works with Ping An in China to do just fintech. And Ping An's the biggest player in fintech in China. So this is a step in the right direction, but this is what we need to sort out. We need more collaboration across this. But the challenge is, and what's missing on this, what's sitting in the middle? And this is what you need. You, don't, you need someone who can access the startups and bring them out to business customers, cities, and technology vendors. And it's challenging because you've got to be independent if you sit in that space. And the challenge is also then, once you do, why would somebody want to work with you on it? But what you want is that person to come in and sit there in the middle and manage the ecosystem. And basically, Spark Labs is going to be doing that. 
So Spark Labs is going to be creating a new global fund, um, an accelerator program based out of Singapore that's going to be working with a number of, of the biggest cities in the world, the industry organizations, they're signing MOUs with ICT vendors and enterprise customers and big MNC brands because we want to bring supply and demand together. We want to create startups and give them a place to go and do their proof of concepts. I don't want to create a startup and have them go out there and risk it. And I should mention, I'll be the new managing partner of that as a side, another side project on the side. Um, and should an accelerator be involved in smart cities? This just came out last week. Spark Lab is already ranked as the top 100 smart city partners in the world. Um, if you think about that, there's no other VC or accelerator in there. They're doing that well already, and we're going to take it to the next level. So if you want to find out more about that, come talk to me at the break. In the meantime, I have no idea whether I'm over time or not, but I'll give you the quick four conclusions. Remember these things. Question the hype. There's a lot of BS numbers out there. Just be careful with what you do with them. Focus on people, not technology. Innovate and think about innovating in different ways and collaborate. The only way we're ever going to reach anywhere close to the possibilities is if we start working more together as an industry and as an ecosystem. On that, thank you very much for your time. Folks, uh, thank you to, to the both keynotes. We're now on the break session. And you're more than welcome to address and to ask the keynoters any questions that you want during this networking session. Thank you. When you come back, we'll have the panel of experts who will add, I think, some very valuable points of view to what you've just heard from our two keynoters. See you in 15. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, my name's Matt. Uh, I'm from WSP. I'm the head of Smart Places, and we'll be uh, moderating this uh, kind of speed panel this evening. Each of our speakers has got eight minutes with their presentation, and at the end, we'll finish up with uh, 15 minutes of question and answer um, from some of the things that we've heard from the presentations and from uh, some questions that you might have from the audience. Um, so to give a little bit of context of where this panel sort of come from, um, uh, it, it's, I quite like the title of it, uh, The Smarter the Buildings, the Smarter the City. So if we're thinking about the building scale to start with, um, I think we'll all certainly attest to the fact that there are a lot of complexities out there. Everybody seems to be selling an IoT big data blockchain analytics thing in the cloud. Um, and it's uh, caused uh, a lot of concerns. It means that projects are very difficult to get off the ground. And if you're not careful, you end up in a bit of a muck and fuddle. But don't worry, because we have assembled the superheroes of Smart uh, to tell us more about what they're working on, uh, some of the things that they've learned to uh, essentially help us with our Smart City goals from their experience in the scale of buildings. Uh, so on the panel, uh, we'll start furthest to your left. Uh, is Franz Camerl, who is the head of product management for wiring accessories in the smart infrastructure department at Siemens. Rosie Bremers, the VP of Business Excellent at uh, Vision Connect. Uh, I can't say it, I'm sorry. At Vision X, is that right? There we go. Um, Dr. Ken Dooley, Technology Director at Grandland and Postdoctoral Research at Alto University in Helsinki. And Kathy Farrington, uh, who is Technical Program Manager at Google. So, without further ado, uh, let's start with our first presentation uh, from Franz. If you'd like to make your way to the podium. Uh, so, Franz was elected the president of the KNX Association uh, in May 2017, and since then he has been developing worldwide activities to support the internationalization of the KNX technology all over the world. So, please put your hands together for Franz's presentation on growing the smart ecosystem. Thank, thank you very much for that. Uh, eight minutes is not long, so I start. You can read what the, the theme of my presentation is. And uh, I would like to start with the introduction of the KNX Association. Maybe not all of you know that. And we are um, close to 500 uh, manufacturers, uh, which are uh, in this association uh, producing all of them products, uh, mainly actuators and sensors for uh, uh, 
intelligent network in the building for all the different applications. And uh, we have uh, roughly 90,000 uh, partners in the market. They are doing installations with our products, bringing that into intelligent buildings. This can be smart homes. This can be smart buildings, uh, commercial buildings, uh, different types. And we are worldwide represented. Uh, mainly one of the important points is that we are, uh, sorry, that we are uh, able to uh, have 45 uh, national organizations in different countries of the world. It starts in the US and it ends up in Asia, China. Uh, lots of them are uh, doing the promotion of the KNX technology in their countries, in their regions, and this is one of our success factor, factors. I will not go through all these details according to the time, but I would like to uh, show you over the last, uh, let's say, a uh, few years, nearly 20 years, how we increased by uh, partners in the different countries in the world, and now we are represented in 166 countries in the world, so it's really covering uh, close to the number of countries where Coca-Cola is selling their products. <laughs> what are we doing in applications? Uh, everything which is in infrastructure in an intelligent building uh, needed to be used is our target not our as association, the target of our companies, they are manufacturing products. This can be sensors from the thermostat, a simple temperature sensor, a light level sensor, actuators to switch something on to control an uh, HVAC. All these different applications are uh, in the target of our partners, our companies, they are member in the, in the association. And uh, this is security, this is energy management, this is metering, this is lighting control, this is HVAC. Each and everything which is in a building, in an intelligent building needed, is offered by our members. When we talk about a uh, small city, then uh, we always have to, uh, to take into account, and we heard a lot of them, a small city is uh, not uh, something which exists by itself. A smart city uh, contains out of smart buildings. It has a smart information and communication uh, technology network. And it has a smart grid to bring the energy into that building, into that buildings, into that different areas. And what is out of our perspective very, very important, it has smart users. Lots of, uh, of, of, of uh, people talking about smart cities, they do, uh, forget that there are people that are using that, and the people are the most important element therein. And uh, this is the point where we really take care on, together with our uh, member companies, that the users are involved into the uh, offering. Just to give you an idea about uh, uh, a project where we uh, first started to uh, work on uh, smart cities, and this was uh, during the 2012 to 2016, we have done that with uh, Lyon in France to uh, evaluate what is the possibilities of KNX applications in the smart city. And uh, we concentrated in that on the development of new energy. We uh, evaluated new technology for, uh, for, for different applications. And stable energy supply is one of the most important points. But we also took a uh, uh, look on uh, domestic projects as well. One of the most important outcomes out of this pilot project was that we not only have to take care on home electronic management system, we also have to take care on the uh, consumer. And these are, at the end of the day, the people they are using that day by day. They have to understand really uh, what uh, is going on. And the community energy management is one of an element which has to be taken uh, care as well. We as KNX bring in sensors, actuators, equipment into the building. The building are part of an infrastructure, and this is at the end of the day then the element in a smart city where we are 
contributing our products into that uh, uh, area. Smart users. This slide shows how the uh, balance between the automatic, just focused on uh, the energy consumption, how the automatic buildings are confusing sometimes people, and the influencing of the people. And we have to find a balance between this. The people have to have the possibility to influence what's going on in the building. Otherwise, they do not like to use all this technology. And they are not concentrating on a really a smart technology when they are not able to influence. And this is uh, one of my uh, core messages I would like to, uh, to give to you. Don't forget the users. And KNX is one of the leading systems working in that area, providing uh, actuators and sensors into the market. And if there are any questions, later on I've learned. Thank you very much. I hope I'm been, I've been in time. Um, a quick question for you. Um, what's the best application that you've seen of uh, KNX to date? Uh, I guess it's uh, uh, the, the, the most common is uh, what is used is uh, lighting control, but it is not lighting control just by actuators and by sensors. It's lighting control in all different applications, uh, remote controlled, uh, automatic controlled. This is the, the today most used uh, application. Okay, KNX for lights, love it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, uh, Rosé, as our next speaker, uh, please take to the podium. Um, while she does that, uh, Rosé, uh, for those of you that don't know, is a data strategist and business excellence professional with over 25 years of experience with a passion for lean process management, accelerating growth with the implementation of full cycle process design, including monitoring of processes against some key performance indicators. Um, here is Rosé's presentation on connecting the smart workplace to the smart city. Thank you. So imagine connecting the smart workplace to the smart city. What do I mean by smart? I mean saving time and energy, and also producing products and services that are innovative, that are sustainable. We also need people like you who embrace these technologies and events like this to help us showcase them. What do we get as a result? We get a greener planet, and we get an empowered population. At Vision Act, we've been doing this for the past 10 years. I mean, we've been producing products and services with this in mind. We do this through e-paper technology. Why e-paper? Well, it's extremely efficient, energy efficient. The battery lives last between 3 to 12 months. They have no glare under direct sunlight. In, in fact, the brighter the sun shines, the more visible the displays become. There is no additional heat generated, so the devices can run 24-7. And the simplicity of their design integrates seamlessly with the environment. So today, I'm going to show you five products. The first four relate to smart cities. The first product is our solar-powered signage. This one is, a, is in Sydney. There are 400 of them. They have a 0%, almost a 0% fi near failure rate, and uh, they, are, they are solar powered. The next product is our bus stops. If you are in Australia, if you're in the US, Dubai, or New Zealand, you may come, you may come across one of these bus stops. They are also, they can be solar powered as well, or not, depending on the requirements of the smart city in question. The next product is our public displays. The one up here is in Boston, and there are 80 of these displays in the US. And the fourth product is our truck advertising displays. Now, this can be used for both advertising, like you see up here, or they can also be used for traffic alerts. The cool thing about these ones are that they are, the information displayed on them can be, are, is location-based. So if you have, for example, the, the truck going by a city that has uh, traffic ahead, you could display that. As the truck moves to the other city and there is ice on the roads, for example, it could display that as well. So it, it makes your smart, your, <clears throat> your smart city population a little bit more empowered um, and safe. 
So those were the, those were the smart city products. The last product, but definitely not the least, is very valuable. And it's valuable because it's personal. And I mean personal because it helps you in your everyday life at the office. The product I'm talking about is Joan. Joan is the greenest room booking system out there. And by the greenest, I mean 99% more green than any other LED or LCD display. You might ask, well, what is a room, room booking system and why do I need it? I've come up with three, three of my favorite use cases. There are many, but I'm just going to go through three today. The first one is, have you ever needed a meeting room quick to discuss something? And you, for example, you're by the water cooler, you're by the coffee machine, you and your colleague come up with a great idea, you want a meeting room now. Well, with Joan, you could walk up to the meeting room, it's mounted right next to it, and you could press the Meet Now button. That automatically updates whatever calendar your office is using. We integrate with them all, being G Suite, iCal, uh, or Office 365. And, it will, and you and your colleague can go straight into the meeting and turn your ideas into action. The second use case is a classic. I've worked in, more, in over four countries, and I can tell you this is a universal one. And that's when somebody is in your meeting room the one you've booked, and you want to politely ask him to leave. And sometimes polite is a, little bit, is a little bit of a challenge. But with Joan, it's very easy, because Joan clearly states whose meeting it is and what's going on in that meeting room. So what we do at VisionEct and what some of our customers do as well, because, because Joan is magnetically mounted, you can literally pull it off the wall and just smile and show, um, hey, my meeting. Um, and usually it's just like a hands up, OK, fine, yeah sorry, and they leave. So it's, it's, it's very convenient, and it keeps your workplace culture uh, frictionless. And the third one is that time slot, usually a prime time time slot, like Monday, 9 AM, where the, the main meeting room is always booked, but nobody's ever there. I'm sure, it's, I'm sure you all relate to one of these. It's, it was probably booked by someone that's not even in the company anymore. Well, we call these ghost meetings. And Joan eliminates ghost meetings by allowing you to take over a room if nobody's actually using it. And you could also have, it, have Joan do this automatically. So if nobody checks into the room by pressing the check-in button, then Joan can automatic rele automatically release it, meaning that that room can be made available to the rest of the staff. So Joan, from an idea, has become kind of like a revolution. It's, we have over 7,000 companies using it. That means that their, their buildings and their workplaces have taken one step closer to become smart buildings and smart workplaces. It's now in over 20 languages. And by the end of this year, we're going to have it in Arabic and Chinese as well. So we're very excited about that. So we, you've seen today how we have taken one technology, which is e-paper technology, and we've used it by, to connect workplace and, and smart cities. The VisionEct team has been doing this for over 10 years, as I said. We do this for you because we know that your time and your energy is key. And we've built this into our business strategy, and we've made this our business. So right now, my time is up. But I'm, obviously, I'm going to be here to answer any questions. I'd like to thank you for your attention and wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you. I really like that. I've never seen that e-paper technology in a city uh, context before. I really liked the uh, advertising on the back of the truck. It kind of makes me think of, you know, in Harry Potter when they read the newspapers? Yeah. Yeah. It feels like that's uh, going to be a thing. It is. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okie doke. Our next presentation, uh, if you would like to take to the podium, comes from Dr. Ken Dooley, um, who has 15 years of experience in the built environment and has worked in London, Sydney, Dublin and Helsinki. Um, but at Alto University, his research focuses on smart city services, smart buildings and the sharing economy. He is also the host of the citizen-centric podcast, uh, which focuses on user-centric smart cities. So here is Ken's presentation on solving the smart building user experience. Okay, thank you. 
Um, so I come from a kind of an engineering company where we're mostly kind of doing building design. We do a lot of energy efficiency projects as well. So when you hear someone like me talking about user experience that comes from the engineering side, it kind of indicates there's a bit of a hype or a bit of a problem around some of the kind of core smart building technologies. Um, I'm also an innovation team member as well. So we spend a lot of time talking about buildings full of controls, buildings that are going to be uh, controlled and powered by AI. But there's a kind of there's a disconnect between the discourse and the kind of buildings we sit in in every day. So, you know, when we talk about smarter user experience, um, I'm an engineer, the company I come from is an engineering company, so, you know, we think of, you know, space use measurement or something really boring like leak detection um, or controlling lighting and these kind of things. But actually, when we come to buildings and we start talking to users, what kind of smart buildings do you want? They kind of talk about, I want to see where the car parking spaces are that are free. Um, I want to be able to find a colleague that he's in the building somewhere, but I don't know where he or she is. Um, if I give feedback, I want one-click feedback. Um, and I'll show in a moment as well, if you're in a, a business park or a large kind of um, office environment where there's a couple of restaurants, people really want to know, as one of their top things on their list, how big is the lunch queue? Um, and actually, there's a kind of word around this now as well, which is this kind of idea of designing for friction free. So designing spaces that take away all the kind of annoyances, the things that annoy you or waste your time, uh, the things that stop you from doing your, your daily work in offices. Um, so, so this is the kind of things that, that, that we're kind of being pushed towards. Um, two, three years ago, we wrote a kind of white paper digging deep into IoT and buildings and smart buildings. We did it with Aldo University and Delft University and ourselves in Granlund. And we were kind of talking about kind of smart buildings, so what? We kind of talked about where is the wow? Why should anyone care? Uh, turning on the lights with your voice, that doesn't really change, um, kind of ha doesn't really change how I experience the, the buildings. Um, and in that discussion, it kind of came that there might be tw 10 or 20 or 30 technologies, and the cumulative effect is uh, a lot of things change. But, but when we've been talking to building owners and people who want to renovate buildings, they've kind of said, OK, we don't have the budget for this super smart building. We get that a huge effect happens when everything is, is digital and everything is controlled and, and there's lots of sensors. But where do we start? And that's kind of the discussion we're having now. Um, and this is why kind of user experience has come to the fore of the discussion. So if I give some really simple examples, uh, just like Rosie said as a moment ago, there's a lot of kind of things around smart office apps, find a desk, find a meeting room, these kind of things. That's from Flowscape in Sweden. Um, another really simple example is in healthcare and hospitals. In, in Finland, some of the hospitals and some of the um, healthcare clinics, uh, you kind of check in with your ID card. There's a barcode in the back of your ID card. You don't have to walk to the, to the floor to find a reception area. You don't have to queue. You don't have to kind of speak to anyone. Um, you can really seamlessly at the entrance, almost like checking into a, to a, um, an, a, an airplane. Um, you can kind of check in and say, OK, um, where do I need to go? It tells you what room to go to, um, it, it, and it tells you what time your appointment is at. So this is a really nice kind of something that's super, super simple to use. Um, it's the kind of thing I really like using. But what's, what's really important when we consider these kind of technologies is, at the same time, the doctor gets a notification, and I've seen this happen, um, that the patient has arrived. If you arrive early, they can see you early. Uh, they might spend more time with you. They might clear some time at the end of their day. If you're late, we, we get told the doctors go to the toilet. If someone's two or three minutes late, they get a cup of coffee. And at the same time, the same really simple user experience kind of technology is kind of creating statistics for, to help us manage the operations. And this is kind of what we see user experience. It's, a, it's, a, it's the starting point, but if we do it really well, it kind of helps us to be more productive and helps to be more efficient. Um, this is an example from kind of one of my favorite startups in Finland. Um, They've taken a kind of a lighting control from hotels and kind of controlling curtains from hotels, and they've put it on an app. Now, they're originally a lighting company. The investment for this is coming from user experience in a hotel room. What's a cool hotel room? It's one where you can turn the lights on with your phone. It's one where you can open the curtains with your phone. The hotels then ask them, can you please do smart locks so they don't have to carry a card around with them so they, they can open the door with their, with their phone. And then through like floating switches, you also kind of say, leave me alone, don't, don't disturb or clean my room. And now what's happening is, we didn't know the use case for this, but now by starting off with kind of a cool experience lighting control app, 
in a hotel. They're now being paid to manage the cleaners. They're now a cleaner management software company. They show the cleaners when the rooms are occupied, which rooms don't want to be disturbed, which rooms uh, need their rooms cleaned. And now we found a new use case recently as well. If you're in a hotel where their software is, then, and you're in bed at 11 a.m. with the lights off and the curtains closed, the receptionist will call you and ask you if you'd like a late checkout. So the idea is now they're up, kind of upselling extra services from the hotel. So when you digitize things, when you create kind of user experience software, when you put things in the hands of people, we kind of don't know where the kind of new, the new use cases are coming from, but, but, but this is the kind of most uh, easy place to start. And, and like, like Charles said before as well, it's not, a, it's not a kind of CapEx expenditure, it's something really light. You're inserting software in the building to help you get started in making it smart. Uh, one case we've just worked on that kind of shows some of these things is actually Nokia's headquarters in Finland. It's 3,000 staff. They had this real focus on um, improving user experience in the campus. They wanted to somehow create more collaboration. Um, so in the kind of information age, productivity now equals collaboration. Collaboration doesn't happen in meeting rooms. It kind of happens when you bump into people. We talk a lot about designing for serendipity sometimes. Um, and they also have the situation where people are, are working from home quite a lot. So when we went through the whole smart building technologies, um, all the different things they could do, they came up with number one, they wanted a smart office app on a phone and on their laptop. Uh, you know where people are because it uses Bluetooth on your laptop and your phone to know where you are. If there's an empty room that is an ad hoc room, so a non-bookable room, when you walk inside, it reserves it for you because it detects you on, on, on Bluetooth. So they put um, location beacons around the, around the office building, and then everything else is done essentially with the phone and the laptop Bluetooth. The next thing they asked was, um, they have a couple of restaurants, they have kind of sushi and vegetarian and bowls and pizza. They kind of wanted, can I pay for my desk? Um, and can I see on the campus, before I turn up at the sushi place or the pizza place, can I see how long the queue is? Now, when you kind of consider these kind of things, the, the smart office software that's, that's kind of showing people where the free spaces are, showing people where their colleagues are if they want to be found. It's a really light technology. It's really low capital expenditure. There's a really high uptake on using it because that's what people want to use. But it's kind of showing us which spaces are free. It's kind of showing us, it's giving us our space efficiency, our operational efficiency information that's really important for us. Okay. So and this is the kind of main conflict then. It's this balance between home and an office. Uh, they want to make their offices friction-free and enticing. This is the language they're saying. They want to have kind of uh, food-related kind of restaurant things around parking, um, around letting visitors into the building. And then they want to pop up the things that attract you to come to the office. So it's kind of a, a Nike pop-up store, or a place you can get your snowboard waxed, or a place you can get your bike maintained. And you kind of wouldn't go to the office the next day, but you can, oh, I can get my bike maintained. So this is the kind of focus they're coming from. So it's this idea of um, attracting people and having services and software that makes the office area smart. So then the last thing I'm going to say is this is kind of what we've seen. Um, you have a user experience software paid for maybe a change management or a campus experience people. You have a smart building budget. Uh, normally these are separate. What we're seeing is that there's a kind of a lot of overlap in them. And, and it's quite easy to get people to pay on user experience. And then when we come along having kind of project management and manage the kind of user experience elements, we then kind of go back again and talk about the smart building budget and a lot of data that for the that has already been created by the user experience. And now our kind of smart building budget to make the building smart has kind of been reduced. So we, we piggyback on the data that's been provided by user experience. Um, so from a smart building designer point of view, now we're actually saying start with user experience, get as much data from that as possible, as much benefit from that as possible, and then fill in the gaps with smart. OK, thank you. A quick question from me. Um, I, I noticed that you were speaking about uh, a hospital. Yeah. Why do you think we've uh, focused so much on the workplace when we talk about smart? That's a really good question. I think they're easy because they're kind of predictable. Um, so you know, we expect them to be occupied between 9 and 5. And then anything outside those hours, we can play with. We can turn things off depending on. Um, but if, but 
a hospital is kind of really difficult to manage. You have lots of different spaces that are open 16 hours, 24 hours, 12 hours. Um, and also, we, we need to learn on spaces like offices because we don't want to turn the lights off in a hospital in case we're kind of really doing something dangerous. Fair enough. So <laughs> we'll use the offices as our kind of playground, our learning ground. Thank you. Um, off the back of that, one of the first questions I have for you is, what's the most worrying thing you've ever seen in a um, smart building's implementation? Um, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I think just at the moment, uh, the, the main issue is that the cybersecurity is an afterthought when um, it's being built. So a lot of times, um, you know, when I was a consultant previously or whatever, you'd walk into a building and everything that was set up while the building was being built is still there. So you'd have yeah. the modems still connected, you'd have you know the systems still connected, the builders would still have the passwords. You know, all of that could kind of uh, sit and be in place. Okay. Uh, then around actually trying to pull this off in practice. Are you able to find the skills in the construction sector? Because this sounds like quite an IT thing, and if I thought about taking that to some of my property clients, they'd be a bit spooked by it. Yes, so it's a journey, um, and uh, skills gap is one of the biggest things holding it back, I would say. Um, but this is why we're trying to make everything we're doing public and open and you know, releasing standards and things, um, and, and working with a lot of consultants, so new roles like digital building consultants, working with integrators who can help the builder. Um, and I think one of the other things is by pulling software out of the construction, you're also not forcing them to drive agile into their construction, which is just not. Yeah, <laughs> good luck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, Ken, I've got a question for you around the concept of friction-free. Yeah. Um, and I think when we talk about that, particularly when we think about security, and we were having a conversation about this earlier, was when we think about um, friction-free security, which could be facial recognition, which we've seen in a couple of presentations today. But I think when you take that to some people's workplaces sometimes, the first gut reaction is, oh, but you've compromised my privacy. Um, how do you kind of talk uh, two folks about that. Yeah, um, we in the Nordics generally like run away a million miles from any privacy things. We have this kind of balance between the cost of the infrastructure, the accuracy, and then this privacy element. So those three together. Um, in the one case we showed about the 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 kind of the queues in a restaurant, it's a kind of thermal imaging camera. Um, but we wouldn't go anywhere close to. Actually, uh, we even did. Um, we had an audience kind of answering questions recently on five different ways to, to, um, to count people in offices. Um, I think facial recognition had 0%, um, and the most idea was kind of anonymous IoT. So the, if there is sensors under a desk or something like that, then it is kind of anonymous. Um, but we run a very far away from those kind of things in the Nordics at the moment. Uh, there is the kind of idea that maybe um, younger people aren't so interested in, the, in these kind of things. They're not as, as kind of afraid of, of these issues. Um, so it might be old men designing old buildings for old men. Um, but, but at the moment, we're, we're running away from it. Yeah, I'm into that. Um, I've got a question for you, Franz, around uh, KNX. Could, could, could you please speak a little bit louder because that crazy guy is shouting there. Yeah, to be <laughs> fair, that presentation is James going at some, isn't it? Yeah. Um, in terms of when you're looking at um, creating a system that uses KNX, my understanding is that KNX gives you that open compatibility, so you can kind of add anything to the system. Yeah. But what is the business imperative to do that? It's, it's very simple. Uh, when uh, people are buying products, then they are not forced to buy that from one company. They can buy that from a company A or B or C or D, whatever, and mix it up and bring it together into one application in one building and they interwork. Without uh, uh, problems, they can be combined to uh, one system. And it's, uh, no one is forced to use a product for, from Siemens, I would take my company, only from Siemens, he can combine a push button with an actuator, a push button from uh, Legrand, with an uh, actuator from Schneider Electric or from ABB or whoever, and it works. And uh, the key element therein is that we are uh, offering to the market a common uh, configuration tool, which gives the possibility to uh, bring all that together. And by the way, we are not just focusing on KNX technology in transforming our information. We are a specific network. We are 
really in the direction to follow uh, what you have presented, uh, uh, Catherine. Uh, this will be the next level. It will be IP, definitely. It will be IoT. It will be semantic interworking. Uh, all that mechanisms supported by uh, Haystack, by Brick, which is an tagging model first, uh, that will be the future. And that offers then, at the end, really an intelligent infrastructure in the buildings. And based on that, then all the other applications, what we have heard here, can be put on. Because then they are, uh, all the different devices, all the different elements, they can be uh, addressed by uh, whatever there could be come up as an uh, application. Lovely. Um, Rosie, uh, when we're thinking about Joan, are you seeing any applications where uh, that as a piece of technology is helping to drive collaboration? In what sense, though? Um, facilitating the spaces in which people can mix. Are you seeing that, that because when people have tried to implement something like Joan, is it, does it mean that a workforce is able to work together better? Yes, well it, it reduces a lot of friction because uh, it, make, it brings order to the process of booking. Um, we've even introduced uh, what we call a magic check-in and we've integrated with Cisco and you just walk into the room and it checks you in automatically. Um, and we've also integrated with Alexa and Amazon so we can actually, so Joan and Alexa are actually buddies um, and you can, ask, you can ask Alexa um, to book a room for you and uh, she will do it, she will speak to Joan herself oh. and she'll book that for you. So yes, it does improve collaboration. Very and cool. it's becoming more frictionless as we, co as we go along. Yeah, friction seems to be uh, the word today. It's the buzzword, yeah. yeah for sure. Um, can we take some questions from the audience if we can hear you over the Catalan Revolution next door? Any, oh, we've got one there. There's a microphone in the middle if you're feeling brave. I'm uh, Ruben from the Belgian Building Research Institute. I have a question for Franz. Um, we've been talking, when we talk about smart buildings, it's mainly about next to the building management, also about services, what the Joan uh, thing does and all that kind of stuff. I'm asking myself if you um, look at KNX, it's more like building management, building control. How, in what sense are you open to also integrate or interact with other systems uh, to also go into these non-building services. Uh, an example is, uh, by, exa uh, by example, the presence detectors, in which uh, manner are, is it possible to use these data for other applications, uh, for example. Thank you. Okay, but what we as association can do is uh, that we are uh, providing, according to our standards, that the data out of these products are available in a format, in a way that it can be used for services. We as association will not offer that service. It's according to the companies, they are our members, to uh, apply for uh, additional services on top of these products. And what we are taking care on is that uh, there is not a company specific mechanism of uh, the data availability, so that all the installed base can be addressed on most of the important data by each and every one according to a standard mechanism. When we are taking a look on when we have company specific solutions, uh, the solution A and the solution B, then there will not be the possibility that someone comes from top down and address all these applications easily. It could be by semantics but it not easily. Uh, when we are offering that as a common standard across all the uh, companies that are uh, offering products, I guess then is a door opener for that. Happy Ruben. Lovely. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Okay, feeling shy. Uh, one question I do have for the panelists to end on, um, so I hope you're good at thinking on your feet. I would like to know from each of you what is your top tip um, for somebody embarking on a smart buildings project. And uh, Ken, I, I get the impression you're good at thinking on your feet. Would you like to go first for yours? Um, <laughs> I think if we're, if we're being really, really ambitious, I think it's about kind of understanding the service, service dominant city. So we don't go to restaurants anymore if food comes to us. 
Um, so in the future, if I'm getting a health check from another hospital case from a nurse and the nurse isn't going to use any imaging technology or anything, I will expect that to happen in a meeting room in my office building because I'm so worried about time, I'm so worried about friction, why would I drive to a hospital when I'm this special office employee? So understanding how the kind of service logic, how services are coming to us and understanding how buildings can be flexible enough and enable um, a bike maintenance person to turn up in your office building once a month, or in Finland it's snowboards and skis, wax. Understanding how buildings can allow those things to happen um, is something we come up with a lot. So your top tip would be to... Understanding how buildings can be flexible. How can an office building okay. also be almost like a mini retail space? How do we use the restaurant downstairs or the car park to kind of double up and offer these things at weekends or in the evening or the, that flexible built environment? Um, spaces aren't what, we can't have a rigid space anymore. A daycare or a school can't be a school. It needs to add value in the evenings and the weekends and that's what we expect. Gotcha. Rosie, how about you? What's your top tip? Well, I think it's about managing, um, managing people and the change as well. Um, I think that the further we go along, um, as the, the, one of the keynotes were saying, um, it's not just about the technology, it's about managing people and making sure that they um, embrace these, these technologies um, even faster and, and, and put green technologies first, not just pretty, um, uh, pretty ones that, that are not as sustainable. Friends. Openness in uh, the used uh, communication standard. Uh, I have to admit that <laughs> because that gives the flexibility that you, when you are decide to, uh, to, to build a house or to uh, install and, and, and flat, and you have uh, now, let's say, uh, a, a two-year-old child, then you have different applications you would like to have on top of your installed base. Uh, when you are 60 or 63, then you have different applications. Uh, the, the usage of the sensors and the actuators will be in the same way, but the task you would like to achieve is completely different uh, according to your life situation. And uh, open standards gives you flexibility in adapting. And last but not least. Uh, I'd say don't try and do it on your own. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of people in this industry already with lots of different skills. A lot of people in other industries that have complementary skills and I'd just say don't reinvent the wheel. Try and understand what is happening out there, what you do want to achieve and um, make sure you, you work with IT and others to try and achieve that. Lovely. So you heard it here first. The top tips are flexibility, change, open and do it together. Um, I suppose that's the end of our panel. So please a big thank you to Franz, Rosie, Ken and Kathy. And please uh, let's welcome back Bob for some closing remarks. Thank you. <laughs> There's nobody left. Thank you for those who have endured <laughs> the sounds of uh, <laughs> the presentations next door. I'm going to be very brief in my closing remarks. I wanted first to thank our keynotes, Thorsten Mueller from ABB. You know, I'm going to thank Charles, who's come all the way from Singapore to share not his evangelism, <laughs> but his pragmatism about smart cities. And I wanted to thank my panel, who have come from different countries and different places to add information on how smart building fits in to the smart city scene. We're all here on behalf of the Smart Building Conference, which is owned and operated by ISE. And with your support, we'll be back here next year, hopefully presenting more on smart building. And we hope that you've enjoyed the taste of what we talk about during our smart building conferences. If anything, we would hope that we've convinced you of one very important point today, that it's not two separate distinct smart building, smart city markets. There are in fact two markets, but they have a very 
large point of convergence where we feel the overlap gives us a lot in common and a lot to share with one another. We need to talk. And we think that if we come here to the Smart City Expo and World Congress, and if you come to the Smart Building Conference, we'll have the maximum opportunity to learn from one another and to go forward. This is the end of our presentation. If you have any further questions, some of us will be around in case you'd like to talk to us. Thank you very much for joining us and for staying with us.